10 years now. And uh, yeah, started uh, initially as a freelance artist, uh, then head up, headed up their QA team, and then moved on and built their uh, 2D department. I've been working, managing that for the last seven years or so. Uh, yeah, excited to be here. Hey, I'm Pat Wilson. Uh, I currently we uh, co-founded a company called Teak, and we do uh, business uh, analytics and uh, user acquisition and retention for mobile games. Okay. Uh, I got my start at Garage Games in Eugene, Oregon, uh, and just have kind of winded my way through the industry since then. So uh, this panel is titled "Faking Until You Make It," uh, and it's not about that title or that. Or that title, or that title, or that title. It's much more about this. This is much more about what it feels like on the day-to-day, month-to-month grind of working in the industry and really trying to improve yourself as a developer of some sort. If you're into art, if you're into design, if you're into coding, QA, or journalism. There's a lot of pieces, but it's a lot of work. And we wanted to kind of share a few experiences about it. So I'm going to start mine here. Um, What faking it means to me. So, uh, for, for everyone out there, faking it um, can mean a lot of things, but specifically to me, it means uh, kind of like the, the act of parody. Uh, being able to see something done at a high level, uh, a lot of gymnast routines, uh, stand the comedy, a, lo- a lot of things that take a lot of technical proficiency, um, and being able to go, well, maybe I can do most of that. Maybe I can do 80%, 50%, 30% of that type of work and put it out in a reasonable time or level. So. When I'm, when I'm thinking about it, it, it's really just coming down to being able to put out the best I can, even if it's not the greatest. Um, so, a little bit of background on me. I started off with literally no education in any of this. I did not go to school for this. I did not go to get a degree in basically anything. I just had a lot of love for video games, as I'm sure literally everyone in this room does. Unless you're a parent of a kid who does. And then maybe you don't have to. Um, But for the most part, it was just a lot of passion, a lot of drive. So I decided to say, maybe I can write a little bit of stuff. I liked doing a little bit of the creative things here and there. But I really, really wanted to work in video games. So I put in a little time and effort. I started reading books. I started finding resources that really pushed me forward into understanding game design. And I landed my first gig. So I worked with a company called Na Games in uh, Sacramento uh, on an indie project that was a three-player puzzle game. And... What I had quickly learned was from doing my own little writing myself, creating little stories here and there, was working with a team was a little different. We had a five to six man team, um, but I, I didn't understand a lot of things. I didn't know that, hey, as a game designer, I'd be forced to create not only you know the dialogue for the game, ooh, I get a right story, but I also have to create all of the levels and mechanics and interactions. And then I had to create the documentation for that to send to the engineering, and they'd have to understand me. That's a big thing I didn't understand is if I talk to an engineer and I say, yeah, the mechanic's got to shoot lightning, they say, well, what does that mean? I go, oh, that's a good point, because I just wanted lightning. Um, so, so through this, I, I, I started researching. I said, hey, what does Google have to offer? What, what are these websites, these forums? Where can I learn, what can I learn from reading an article on Kotaku? What can I learn from uh, a Unity forum about uh, game development and how to better a piece of content in a reasonable amount of time with the team. From there, I learned a little bit about interaction. I learned how to communicate better. So on my second game, I was accidentally put as a lead. Uh, By accident, I I had a ton of history in working with fighting games. I was a tournament player for a really long time. Uh, I knew a lot about their mechanics. So when the team found me, they were kind of like, hey, you should run this whole thing. So this was a 50, 50-ish man team over Skype that was in 12 different countries. We had people in Japan, people in South Korea, the Middle East, Europe, all doing voice acting work, artwork, design, engineering. And I had to then go and work with engineers in such a way that I had never done. I didn't just say, hey, I need to be a lightning bolt. I said, frame two of the jump animation for your character special cancel needs to not only change states to airborne, but also needs to be allowing block state and push block state. Yeah, that's really detailed prep that no one needs to know. But that's the type of stuff you have to learn. You have to get into that level of depth. So I needed to read. I needed to keep research. I needed to really learn what it meant to build at that level. I was was kind of leveling up at this point. I knew the right design. I knew how to talk a little bit. I knew to communicate in a way that wasn't just like, you're doing it wrong. But 
now I need to be able to explain my thoughts. I need to really be able to go point by point, like, oh, this bit of code is wrong. Here's how you do it. So that got me through part two. Part three, that end game boss. I'm working for Sony currently, and I didn't think I'd ever end up in a AAA studio on my progression path, because, okay. Um, but here was something completely different, because I, was, I went from being a know-nothing to a lead at a random company to kind of working under a group of leads, and here was the big difference, is I was forced to have the technical skills now. I wasn't saying, hey, engineering build this. I was building it. So how do I gain those skills? Where do I go? Well, once again, I needed to know how to learn. That's a huge thing when you try and fake something, is you, you watch the experienced people. You go, hey, who's a colleague in my same position? Ask them, talk to them. Those people are there, they have your back. You want to be able to build yourself a network within a studio if you're working with a large group of people that can support you, that when you come up with a problem, they can solve it in five seconds. You don't have that information. So learning inside of your studio, what it means to be good for your studio. Does your studio need this piece? Does your studio need this artist or this technical skill? If so, maybe find out about it. There's forums all over the internet that teach specific engine-based information and scripting tools. There's more than enough locations to find those tools, but you have to be willing to do that for yourself and for them. So, sorry, I had to kind of stretch my neck here. <clears throat> so, making it also, to me, isn't, is it's specific to me. Is what, what does it feel like I've done to make it? Here at this studio, I've done things that were not developed for the studio. I've, I've pushed boundaries on engines. I've created new content that they would have never expected. But at the same point, that's what making it felt like for me. For other people, it means getting the job, getting hired on is making it. Or really producing your first piece of viable content, putting something out there that someone smiled at, that someone really felt a connection with. That's making it to other people. So when you're on your progress, when you're moving, when you're leveling up as a developer, find what making it is for you then. If this year making it for you is just putting out that first piece of work that really shines to your level, that counts. That works for you. Believe in that content. Because that matters so much on your progression. So here are my kind of top list of skills that everyone should really be good at. And I know reading and some silly things are up there, but you need to be able to have a large amount of organizational skills. Like, you need to be able to come in and if, if a boss says, I need 27 things done in two days, you can't forget one of them. That's it. You just can't forget. Write it down. Take notes. We use infinite levels of communications at different studios. You have your scrum boards. You have your JIRA tasks. You have your LinkedIn emails. You have all these pieces. Use them. They are a tool, not a weapon. They will help you succeed if you give them the opportunity. Create subfolders inside of your emails. Make sure that emails go to the places you need them so you can reference them quickly. Reading, once again, form use. You want to be able to find that information. If you can't find it, someone else has probably already done it and found it and written about it. So these things are great for you. If you can have that skill of finding and digging through material, dense forum notes, understanding the small interactions inside of a blueprint struct inside of Unreal 4, these little weird nuances can push you very far. The third one, if you're a designer, just practice designing, right? A lot of mechanics. See if that gameplay is fun. If you're a coder, you need to code. Create small little bits of, of engine work. Create you know, a new way of rendering something. If you're an artist, as our artist will say probably later on, draw, don't stop, draw, don't sleep, draw. The end. The last thing I do want to mention a little bit about though is vitality. When you work here, every tech industry on the planet is hard. And I mean that in the truest sense. This is not easy. This will take time, this will take your will, and it takes a lot to get through the types of hours and the requirements that it is to do this. So you need to build time for yourself in some of these cycles. You need to figure out how to do a little level of self-care. Because if you cannot keep that vitality up, you will not stay. And that is important. So that, that's most of me. Here's uh, Derek. So kind of harping on what Phil said, a large part of getting into this industry, I'd say it's actually like a 50-50 split between what you can do and the luck. You can have the best skills, be the strongest artist, the best programmer on the planet, and you go, I want to work for Blizzard. 
but Blizzard may not be hiring programmers right now. That does not mean you should give up on what you want to do. There's going to be a lot of roadblocks getting into this industry. Um, one of the biggest parts of this panel is kind of reminding you that failure is a growing tool, not failure. It's just not the end of things. You might apply to a company locally and go, man, I really want to work on the next Civilization game, and they just don't have an opening. So it all starts, really, with your interview and your resume. You can take the same information and present it differently, and it makes a world of difference. I'll give you a great example would be uh, a producer, for example. You know, managing, I managed a team, and we made a game. Does anybody care about that? No. There's no jargon. Nobody knows what you actually did. What skills were you using? If you take the same information and go, manage a JIRA task board for six different teams, produce a AAA game in two years, did this, very specific examples, that's going to jump out at a recruiter. They're going to recognize what programs you use, how you use them, how many people were involved. Um, so don't sell yourself short on your achievements. It tends to be a real habit, getting started, to kind of be like very general. Focus on your accomplishments and not just your tasks. If you say you're a QA tester and you tested games, so did every other QA tester out there. What did you as a tester bring to the game? Did you find 500 bugs related to jumping? Were you specializing in flow and monetization in the marketplace? These are all little details that make a very big difference. Um, you know, formal skills moving into it. Like, anybody can say, I'll kind of jump into this actually straight with what my next one is. Assuming, nope. Wrong one, sorry. <laughs> So for me, I started writing for GameFAQs when I was 14 years old. Um, my first review is embarrassing to look at presently. It's about a paragraph and a half, there are spelling errors, and it's really shameful to review. But I stuck with it. I kept writing more and more, and I started doing that because I wanted to do this for a living. I would read Game Informer, if anybody here is a fan of Game Informer back in the day. You know, <laughs> I appreciate the honesty. Um, you know, I said, I can do what those guys are doing, but I can do it better. I thought. Uh, once you actually get into doing it, you realize how hard it is to be gracious and humble at the same time, while also being critical and analytical. Uh, my reviews nowadays are almost like five and a half pages. It's something you would see on like Kotaku or Ars Technica or something. Way more detailed, breaking down hardware, software, etc. Iter iterating on your skills open doors. And with that in mind, I started writing about uh, MMORPG.com in particular. That's what got me my first gig. I had no interest in going into QA at all. Never even crossed my mind. And a Funcom representative called me and said, hey, and they folded out all my reviews in front of me from the last decade and said, we know what you do. Do you know what we do? Now this is kind of an interesting position to be in because when you're writing reviews, you want to be a little scathing and almost harsh sometimes, I feel. Uh, it's really easy to go, oh, this game really sucks, don't buy it, right? Anybody can do that. That is not a skill at first. You learn how to get more delicate and targeted. With QA, you think about, why did this suck? What didn't I like about this? What took this game from being a 10 to a 6, comparatively? When I had my interview, um, my boss-to-be asked me this question that I thought was laughable. But he asked me to make a peanut butter sandwich. I kid you not, he goes, I want you, with every detail you have, to write down every step in a peanut butter sandwich. Very random, right? But it was a test that really became practical. It was taking all the critical evaluation skills of game writing and putting it into reproduction steps moving forward. When you think about making a sandwich, what do you think? You grab the bread, a knife, and the canisters and go. Where'd you get the bread from? Did you have a knife? Did you have to wash the knife off? What kind of peanut butter? These are all the details you don't necessarily associate with, but they came naturally as a result of writing. So even though I had no direct QA skills of my own, this translated very naturally between it. You develop a critical eye, you translate it into an actionable, reproducible behavior that gets you paid and gets you in. When I first started, I ran in circles in the walls. I didn't really know what else to do, but I know that I hated, as a gamer, getting stuck in terrain. So that was what my focus was. For weeks, I ran into every wall in the map, just being like, here's a, here's a broken area, there's a broken area. Seems mindless, and yet it teaches you detail, thoroughness, um, just different ways of testing. From there, we moved on to a completely different role. I started working on Paragon for Epic Games. Um, this was a very different set of skills. 
in development with QA, there are very set, clear goals. Find the bugs, report them, reproduce them, and send them to the right place. With playtest, it was a little different. There were no clear metrics. You're gauging how people felt about your game versus how the game worked. This is really different. This is taking what Phil and Marshall and Pat are doing and translating it into a subjective feeling. Um, how many of the people in the audience, for example, have ever played a Call of Duty game in your life? How many of you still play Call of Duty to this day? You see the difference in the stands, right? Only a handful of you still like the game, but at some point, everyone's played one. My job with Playtest was to gauge that metric and translate it into what makes this game fun for as many people as possible. What makes it so that you want to pick this up? This is a little bit related to QA, the technical aspects and things like that. Testing, finding gameplay styles and metas that were enjoyable. But a lot of it also is related to writing. What is the community saying? What is it that they don't like about the game? From the development side, we know what we want to achieve. But what does the community want out of the game? What do they feel is missing? And so when you're focusing on these abstract tangibles like that, it's really easy to just get lost and sell yourself short and go, I can't do that. But you can. Because even when I started, I would be the first one to tell you I had no idea what I was doing. I was faking it all day as being a person who could handle this. But you pick up, you listen, you pay attention to the details, you start reviewing your own notes, and you start to find trends. And it just starts to come naturally. In a sense, fake it till you make it is not only like really a lifestyle, but it's important because it's more like fake it till you've made it until it clicks, until you're good at it. It's not gonna come instantly, you're gonna fail a lot at it. But it's important that you don't take failure as a shutdown, you take it as a chance to do better. And that moving forward, going from running a place test to running your own team in a studio, entirely different. No longer am I following your footsteps, I'm making the footprints for you to follow. Suddenly, I have to anticipate testing needs, I have to anticipate staffing needs, I have to anticipate things that have never been once in my plate or control that I've had to learn to adapt. And this is really important to understand that these little baby steps are growing you as not only an employee, but as a person. You're great in your scope is growing and analyzing with your career. Uh, I don't really feel the need to go into that too much, but it's just more of understanding that needs are going to change too based on each position. In regular QA, I needed to know how to make a bug. In playtest QA, I needed to understand investors, people who were putting millions of dollars into our company. Running a QA team, now you're working with engineering and coding and programmers who have completely different concerns. So even though I've grown into all these roles, I didn't know how to do any of them at the start. And I think it's really important that everybody understands not to sell yourself short. Shoot for the position you want and not the position you know you can do. You should push out of your comfort zone for growth. Um, so I'm just going to give an example here, and don't look. So I'm going to ask two questions here. I'm going to ask Phil here to get me a groceries with the list I've provided on that, that sheet behind me. I'd like Marshall to also pick me up six groceries without any clear goals. Give me six groceries, Phil. Six, six groceries or just some groceries? Just the ones up there. It's fine. Oh, okay, I, I got you some groceries. I'm, not, I'm, I'm waiting for his answer, man. Like he, he goes right. first. He's going to copy. <laughs> so Marshall, take using the list of groceries up there, what would you get me? Oh, you what don't get a look at that. Yeah. Oh, right up there. How much of your list matched his list? If you, if you see the difference here, <laughs> this is something that happens a lot in game development. So if I come to you and say, I'd like you to make me a level, that's all you're getting. It's real easy to mess up that level. It's real easy to just fall real short of the mark. Maybe you've made a level heavy on platforming uh, with lots of jumps and, and shooting. And maybe what I wanted was an RPG storyline where a main character is getting injured and it's very dramatic. You come with your content and you present it in a meeting and you, you feel really good about it. You know, you've shown it to other people who feel good about it, but they your liked lead it. wanted something completely different. Um, they, the, the other guy didn't like it. <laughs> The, the important guy didn't like it. Everyone else was like, oh, that's really cool, that's really fun. And then the other guy was like, nah. So, so in the example presented, Marshall has shown up with everything that I asked for. And it's like, great job, you've done it. But I told him, he knew what to bring to the table. Phil, I brought gummy bears. Yeah. 17 pounds of gummy bears. Phil has shown up with a completely different set of Two items. bottles of vodka. 
and despite doing his best, so I got he brought 20% the right. wrong things out. So this is something that happens often in the game industry. You're given very little direction, very little training, and you're taught to just sort of go. And it's important to understand that different studios will have different flaws there. Some will give you tons of direction, tons of feedback, tons of knowledge and resources. Others will just tell you, you, I want you to just make me a level. I'm not gonna tell you anymore, but when you hand it in, it's gonna be the wrong level, and you get to do it all over again. This happens far more than you might think in the game. All industry. the time. <laughs> all 100%. The time. Well, okay, like 78. But kind of harping on the same thing. Because of that, you can get really conflicting feedback. You can do something that is actually really awesome, but that might not be what the project asks for. Um, this happens a lot more, which I will use this to transition to Marshall here in a moment, with the art side of things. Art can make some truly phenomenal resources in a game, but sometimes they're too expensive graphically. They break the system. They, they overtax the performance of the game itself. The frame rate drops. All of a sudden, while they made this beautiful, glowing cutscene that is just marvelous, it's actually got to be dumbed down into just a really basic vignette that's just barely getting in there. And uh, so again, it's not that you've done bad work. It's just that your work was actually beyond what was necessary. Um, and it's important to recognize that that happens way more than is giving credit to the industry. I'm going to jump straight to Marshall on this and let him kind of talk about the art side of things. All right. Um, so this isn't so much about fake it as you make it. I'm just going to dovetail in off of what he was just saying, and it's something that comes up a lot from the art side, and if you are an expiring artist, you're going to run into this a lot. You're going to come to someone, and you're going to be like, hey, here's my portfolio, and they're going to look at it, and they're going to say, no, this, I can't use you. And that doesn't mean what you're doing isn't awesome. It just means that they can't use it for what they need. Like, you might be a hammer, and they need a screwdriver. So that is one of the uh, most consistent things that I see where people think, shoot, I, I, I'm not good enough, or I need, to, I need to quit, or I need to change what I do. And that's not saying you don't take feedback and try to get better, but just acknowledge and recognize that sometimes, you know, they need a hammer and you're a screwdriver. It's just, it has nothing to do with the quality of your art or what you're doing. Anyhow, going into fake to make it, um, I want to touch back on a couple things Phil and Derek were both saying about organization and about a lot of times you're gonna run into situations where like you will have a meeting and it'll be an hour and a half long meeting and you're gonna leave that meeting and you're gonna have no idea what you're supposed to do now. And one of the key things that you're always gonna to wanna to do is try to leave meetings and figure out what is your actionable item? What can I do next? What am I supposed to do next? And that's a, it's a really key part of the organization that you're, you're gonna to need to have yourself because you're gonna be working in environments that don't think about it, they're too busy. Everyone else has their own things going. Your, your director, your manager, your boss, your client, they're going a million different ways and you're sitting there just trying to figure out what you need to do. And it's a really great skill to be able to go and find that answer. You just keep asking, like, what am I supposed to do? What is my next actionable item that I can do? And speaking of something that I found really helpful, um, and I would recommend, there's a book by, I wrote a note here, David Allen called Getting Things Done. And it's a great for any career, I would recommend it. They should hand you this when you get out of high school. And it just gives you some very practical means of being organized and having you know, just a, a structure that you can apply to any situation, whether you're an artist, whether you're a programmer, whether you're, you're a designer, that will enable you to stay organized. And when you're chaotic and everything's on fire, you can look around, form a structure, and deal with it, which is just tremendously useful. That, again, getting things done, David Allen, I kind of feel bad plugging a book, but I found it really useful. Um, let's see. So yeah, uh, from the art side of it, uh, Propolio is amazing. That's really, I mean, more than anything else, that's what gets you in the door. Uh, it's just having good work. And part of that, again, kind of speaking to what Derek was saying, is be specific about what you're doing, even with your portfolio. Don't just, just because you have done some 3D models and you have done some paintings, like don't just include everything on there because there's just gonna be a lot of, uh, what is this, this isn't great, what, what is that, okay. You know, it's like, you wanna get the stuff that you are passionate about, that you are good at. I mean, definitely tailor your portfolio to what you're applying for, but don't feel like you need to just show them everything. Just show them the stuff that you are, are excited about because that, that passion is gonna carry through more than anything. Um, and tied to that passion then is, is attitude and just the, and I think everyone, I think we're all gonna use that, is attitude is everything. Like it is, uh, it's 
one thing you don't need to be talented. If you have the attitude and you show up on time, people are gonna want to help you. They're gonna want to get help you get what you need to succeed. Yeah, I, I just want to speak on that. Absolutely, a, a lot of the game industry really does work as a, a collaboration and a community. People are willing to teach inside of studios, help inside of studios. There's a ton of support there, but you need to come with the attitude. You need to be one prepared to put in time, effort, and respect other people's time and and not say you need to help me with this work otherwise I won't be able to do it. You need to be able to get the minimum from them that gives you the maximum product from yourself. And also to kind of just put some scope out there for you guys. This is a very small industry. It may seem really good to press the nuclear button and be like, you know what? That guy. That is not something you should do. There are less than 10,000 people in this whole industry. One bad reputation can really blacklist you later on the road. For example, if you don't like your boss, that's fine, but you will work with your boss. Because if your boss moves to another company and you end up there two years later, that is not going to be a pretty fit. You're going to be walking into a bad situation as soon as you get in the door. So the right attitude and positivity, like even if you disagree with how things are done or the way they're being done or who's doing them, it's really important to be a team player. Um, because you may end up working with these people again or for prolonged periods of time and a bad reputation will follow you. Trust me. Yeah, like jumping into that, like all the time, I have artists that I work with that then three years later, they are the CEO of some company that's hiring us to do art for them and then now they're my new boss. And so that's, yeah, attitude's everything. And part of that, like an actionable item for that is communicate, always communicate. If you're an artist and you're gonna be late on a deadline, let your you know, lead know as soon as possible. If you need to go to the client and talk to them about you know, being late on a deadline or you need more information, just communicate all the time. Like that is just the answer to every problem. Like I don't know what to do, communicate. Tell someone, ask a question. Uh, and that's, along with attitude, that is one of the two big things. It doesn't matter what you're doing. That's yeah, key. I guess I'm gonna pass it on. Yeah, uh, I guess everybody else has said it, but um, I feel like it can still be said again because it's just that important. Um, show up on time is rule number one, and rule number two is don't be an asshole. Uh, it really can, like, the importance uh, cannot be understated. Um, you you will go to game developer conference and you will see the same people, you know, for year after year after year. Uh, you will meet friends, uh, make new friends, and you will, you know, see your old friends. You will see people that you hate. Um, you will see people that you don't respect. But uh, to, and, and as much as you possibly can, don't be an asshole. And uh, I would like to add, do what I say, not what I do. Um, uh, kind of as far as the, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm talking on the programming side, uh, I think that the most important thing that you can do as a programmer, whether you're in the industry or you want to get into the industry, um, is to pick something to build uh, and then build it and finish it and then build something else. Uh, I, I guess I can't really speak too much to, to the resume thing, uh, just because I, I didn't go through that process. I, I kind of got recommended. Uh, I, I kind of cheated my way in. Uh, when uh, I, the game Starseed Tribes came out in 2007 or whatever it was. No, wait, no, 1998. Um, I, uh, I, did the, I did scripting work on that found out that the script bundles were zip files, so I unzipped them and started documenting the scripting language, and I reached out to Dynamics uh, in Oregon and said, hey, you've got bugs, and the lead programmer said, no, we don't, uh, and I said, yes, you do, and I can reproduce them, and then the bugs got fixed, and a, a couple years later, I went out there for an internship. Uh, as far as uh, the, sometimes you don't get a grocery list, uh, that's very, very true on the programming side as well. Um, you may work uh, in a studio or under a producer or a lead programmer that's going to give you a lot of direction. Uh, I have not had that experience, uh, so I'm sure it's out there maybe. Um, my first professional task was port this engine to the Xbox, and I said I've never coded on, on the Xbox. And they said, well, you modded your Xbox and ported our networking library, so you're, you're the best we've got. Uh, this is when the milestones do. <laughs> we need the milestone because we need the milestone money. 
Um, we did not get an Xbox development kit until after that milestone. <laughs> Part of the milestone was running on an Xbox, so I did the development on a modded Xbox. Um, and that was pretty much the direction that I got, is you need to make this work. If uh, it doesn't work, uh, we can't pay you. Okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, so when you are looking to get into the industry, uh, as on the programming side, that is why my advice is you need to pick something and you need to do it. Um, you know, think small, and then you probably haven't thought small enough, so make it smaller. <clears throat> um, but uh, unless you get a very niche programming job in the industry, you are going to benefit uh, from being a generalist. You are going to benefit from being able to uh, rapidly assimilate new information, develop new skills. Um, you're going to need to know how to Google really, really well because if you happen to be attacking a problem that nobody else has ever done, then you get to write about it. But chances are you will, you may never do that in your career. Uh, so it is of the utmost importance that you can self-direct uh, and figure out what your steps need to be to make something work because you may get lucky and you may get a really strong lead programmer at your, you know, at your first gig, you may get a really strong lead programmer that's going to, you know, help you out with the steps, but I would say don't bet on it. Uh, pick something to do, do the thing, finish the thing, ideally ship the, th the thing, make it publicly available. Um, you know, if it's, put your source code up on GitHub, I promise you, your source code is not worth stealing. <laughs> like, do not sit here and be like, oh no, people are gonna take my stuff. Your, your source code isn't worth stealing. And even if it is, programmers, uh, you know, it's, it's like saying, uh, programmer, you don't need to rewrite this. It's like, you know, telling a musician that, no, there have already been enough songs about love. You don't need to re-implement the shader thing. There are already enough sh particle or pixel shaders in the world. Right. That doesn't. That, 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 no. So, um, you know, step one: show up on time. Step two: don't be an asshole. And then step three: be prepared to talk about things that you've done, uh, and show that you can learn new things and make sure you can actually learn new things. Um, I know that a lot of game studios, uh, a lot of technology studios really like programmers who are generalists. They talk about the T-shaped person where um, you have a broad amount of knowledge, uh, a broad amount of skills that you can you know, perform competently, and then you have, a deep, you have deep knowledge of certain areas. Um, and that is a type of programmer that I think everybody likes to work with uh, because you know they have a specialty, but you also know that you can throw a problem at them and say, figure it out. Uh, so I think that's what I got for right now. Want to jump in really quick? That's okay. Just, yeah, so I actually, I want to touch on some things that are not spoken about often within the industry, um, which is the less savory sides of working in the fake it till you make it mentality. Um, one thing that a lot of people I think misunderstand when you're getting staffed and hired for a place, you're typically gonna start off Unless, until you get some real years under your belt or you're just that good, which there are a couple people who are that good, you are going to get contracted. It is very easy to get comfortable in a contracted position. However, chances for growth and opportunity to advance are very rare depending on your field. Um, I started off in QA. QA is very rarely moved up. It takes time and reps. You can often find better opportunities in other studios from where you start, too. It's really important not to limit your own potential because you found a place that gave you a chance. Always be grateful for the chance, but don't limit yourself. If after a six months or a year or two years somewhere, you want to move into something else, make sure that you're telling your team and your leads that. They need to know because a lot of times, too, they're going to tell you outright hey, we're going to get you there, we're going to move you in that path, or they're going to tell you like, ah, no, that's not going to happen here. Don't be afraid to take that plunge. Um, I've been at four different AAA studios now. I've moved up each one and gotten substantially more money, better benefits, better care, and better work hours. 
But when I started, and I'm going to toss this to Phil in a second to talk about the vitality aspect. Um, how many of you in the audience here are familiar with the idea of crunch? Have any of you actually worked at crunch before? A couple of you guys down the front? A um, few on the left side. I see you. Crunch is something you. that is very understated in this field. You can end up working 80 hour plus weeks as a standard. Uh, they call that development hell. That's a real thing. Um, the most I've ever worked in a week is 109 hours. How oh, you beat me by one hour. <laughs> one hour! <laughs> and, uh, and they're both crazy. You know, this is real. You, you'll see people sleeping at their desk for two hours, and that's their day. And then they're back up in the game working on code, working on shaders, working on assets. Milestones, as they harped on, are real. And uh, so it is really important to understand your own personal balance. Faking it until you make it in a sense is saying, is knowing when to put your foot down and go, you know, I'm not working 80 hours anymore. I'm going to go work at this studio over there and work 55 hours. You know, that might not be the, the final jump, the dream. but you've cut off some time. You have a weekend again. You remember what a Saturday feels like. Um, so just remember these kind of things. You know, that, I'm going to let Phil kind of harp on that a bit. Okay, so just, just the understanding that both of these did. Both of these guys over here are crazy for working a 100 plus hour a week, but yeah, that happens. Um, I worked uh, in one of my jobs, I worked a milestone that got extended for seven months. And it was crunched through the entire thing. So it was 60 to 70 hour weeks for seven months. So you need to find a way in this level, in this life, to figure out how that works for you. And if it doesn't, you need to figure out how to move forward in a different direction. Moving forward in the same company, you got your vertical movement. That's not the only type of movement there is. There is horizontal movement. You can shift to a different place. You can find other avenues of success inside of your medium, your art, your choice. All doable. Especially if you're a person putting in 70 hours a week. Yeah, you obviously are committed. You're passionate. You're working hard. But if that's not what's getting you there, if that's not what pushes you forward, if that's not what's giving you the rewards that you think you've earned or that you know you finally succeeded to, then you need to look for something else. It's just a situation that occurs. It doesn't yeah. happen to everyone, and there's always success to be found, but sometimes, maybe not where you're at. Yeah, you gotta know your value. I mean, you gotta, when you really look down, I mean, you only got so many hours on this earth, and you can always make more money somewhere, but you're not gonna be able to make more time. And that's not to say just be an arrogant ass, but definitely be willing to look at yourself and be like, okay, do I really want to be doing this? And what else can I be doing? And is this really getting me to what my dream is? Because like, if you have the passion, like you're going to be able to move forward if you don't get yourself bogged down in a situation you don't want to be in. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I'd say uh, like it's, it's easy to get lost uh, and... Uh, I guess that overvalue how passionate you are about making games, um, but everybody in the game industry is passionate about making games or they wouldn't be there. Uh, it, if, if you're kind of blinded by that passion, uh, you forget to realize that it is still just an industry and it is still just a job. And if you are completely miserable for very, very long periods of time, uh, you are not going to be doing your best work and you are uh, not going to be having a really good time uh, being a human. So um, there are always other places in the industry where you can go that are going to um, have different uh, kind of different regulate, uh, not regulations, different uh, company culture around crunch. Um, Chances are it's always, it's it's going to happen, but like seven months is crazy, yeah. you know. <laughs> sure, like you know, I, I've, I've worked some really long weeks, but it was also like, thankfully, it was just you know that week or a couple of weeks, uh, and then things went back to the more reasonable sixty hours. So, um, but you know, never forget that it is still a job. It, you are you are still selling your time. You are selling your knowledge. You're selling. Uh, you know your expertise in exchange for money uh, and you need to remember that it is a job and not get so caught up on the I'm so passionate about making games because guess what everybody is because if they weren't they would not be crazy enough to work in the game industry so 
And uh, I want to jump back to something else, actually, that Pat was talking about earlier about if you like, if you're a programmer and you're into programming, like build something, and that's I think holds true for probably all of us. I mean, like Derek yeah. was talking about, he was 14 when he wrote his first review. I mean, he was passionate about something and he just started doing it. He's a 14 year old, you know. Like you don't you don't need to wait for anyone to tell you, oh, you're good enough to do this, or oh, I need to get accepted by a game company before I can make games. It's like no, you can start making this stuff now. Whatever it is you want to do, absolutely. And the resources are out there, like Google. It's Google anything you need to know, and you're gonna figure out how to do it. And like, uh, I've a, one of my best friends is a is an animator, and he always wanted to make games, and he was always trying to work with programmers, and it just never really worked out. They were always flaky, and so he just started teaching himself how to program on the bus commute to work every day, and now he's building his own games. And that, to me, just speaks it to the uh, you don't need to wait for anyone to tell you to do this stuff. You can just do it, and and as you're doing that you're gonna get interest. People are gonna start seeing what you're doing. Other artists are gonna wanna start working with you, other programmers, other designers. Companies are gonna wanna hire you. Like, that'll just start to happen just by you following your passion and doing it. So I'd like to open it up to the floor at this point for a Q&A session with the crowd. I'd really like to see what you guys might be interested in asking us, uh, having some opinions about what we talked about, um, or I don't know, if you have a silly math question. It has to be silly. I see you out there. It does not have to be silly. Hey, <laughs> my question is neither silly nor math related. So sorry. Ooh. 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 Are, we, are we good? Okay. Are we done? That's yeah. better. Uh, so my question was, um, in my daily, I, I'm not a program. I don't have any games. I don't have any displays or anything on uh, at the show today. Can you speak a, a little uh, louder? Yeah, sorry. I can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, I kind of. I don't know how to use a microphone. Um, so, my question is, I sit down and play games online on Xbox Live with my friends all the time, and I spend a majority of my time uh, kind of bitching about user interface. And, like, uh, an example that I have used a couple times is in uh, Forza 5. In all the other Forza games, it was kind of more, more or less straightforward. But around 5, they got really flashy, and really shiny, really cool looking, but the user experience, like, when you're trying to get into a race, it was... Back shelf. They didn't. It wasn't priority. So I was wondering if there's a uh, path to take where you can specialize in helping make sure the user user experience or user interface is absolutely. So that's actually a uh, form of design that's hired a lot. It's a UI UX designer. Uh, it's user experience specifically, as well as parts of UI, because it's a lot of uh, the interface a player will have to do. The experience in some games of getting into matchmaking or being presented a mode that doesn't fit for the theme of the game uh, can oftentimes be a huge turnoff for players and player bases. So uh, there is actually a career in that in that specific field. Uh, a lot of it will have to deal actually with uh, part of the QA testing that Derek was talking about earlier in getting uh, player response and understanding from what how they interface with your system. Because you'll get a lot of uh, kind of analytic pieces or telemetry from it where you'll learn uh, when a player has strife or problems getting to what they want to do. You never you never want to be able to pull away your player from using what they want to use, which is a huge thing in a lot of games. Oftentimes, being able to get a struggle to get on your service is a huge decent for a ton of players in MMO communities or stuff like that. So all of a sudden, making sure that that level of connection through your UI as well oh, yeah. as uh, your just general experience of the game is huge. So there is a place for that. There's a lot of well-written articles on the internet for that type of teaching. And yeah. uh, if I could just ask for like clarification, are you more interested in actually programming the UIs or are you looking for the experience that the user is having? Uh, well, I don't have any programming skills, uh, so I don't, I don't program as of yet. But uh, uh, my experience, or my interest would be in like fine-tuning the final experience because like in my example of Force of Five, there's a couple things like you're dumped at the, uh, the start screen with no information about what you're doing. You hit it, you instinctively hit the A button to get things rolling. It says, okay, now hit A to start the game. So uh, with that, there there's two real different avenues for that kind of stuff. QA is obviously, that's where I got my start. You give a lot of feedback with the design teams as dev support, kind of working with them. There's also UX, which is much more based on like the user on a scientific level, studying eye patterns with cameras, um, studying what's the first thing you see when you open the menu, 
how does the UI respond? So I would say figuring out, like identifying, would you rather be more involved with the analysis aspect of that or the implementation? Because the analysis would be more of UX, which is a kind of a different aspect versus the other one being QA and design where you're actually implementing and doing that kind of thing. Um, a great way to get involved with that actually is like Steam Workshop and modding. Just taking a game that already is out there and developing a custom UI that works for you. Um, I'm pretty sure it's kind of like how Counter-Strike was one of the things that sort of developed. Maybe that's yeah, not I'd say, you, I'd say that's a, that, that, that's some good advice. Um, I think that uh, there's, there's a lot of very important work that happens in user experience and uh, streamlining the flow of how people get into games. Uh, it's just incredibly important. Um, and it plays out in more than just UI. Um, it's about in-game tutorials. It's, a, it's really about guiding the user through what they need to know um, without beating them over the head uh, and try and get them to have fun while they're doing it and you and try and get the, them try and get the outcome that you want um, so they're um, whether it's menu design uh, in AAA whether it's um, uh, mobile onboarding and free to play games trying to get people through uh, a really good example of really strong onboarding I don't know if anybody's played uh, Clash Royale by Supercell it's a very, it's an excellent, excellent uh, game, uh, like an onboarding experience. Um, they guide you through what you're going to be doing. Uh, they uh, introduce elements one at a time in an easy to digest way. And by the time you're done with that new user experience, my guess is that 90% of you will want to spend money and you will be holding yourselves back from spending money. Uh, and as far as free to play games go, they just kind of hit it out of the park with that. So. Um, I, I think I think it's 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 incredibly user experience is incredibly incredibly valuable um, not just in games not just in free to play games but in um, really every kind of consumer or even developer facing technology uh, you know endeavor. So there's a lot. Um, if you're looking at uh, take a look for some uh, app teardowns. They're not, it's not necessarily a game, but how people do UX teardowns. Uh, uh, what they talk about, what's the terminology that they use, uh, how do they organize their thoughts. While it may not be game specific, it's still um, a language that's going to be universal within user experience. And if you're looking for an item of like, hey, I want to make something, um, like a, a mod's not a bad idea, but um, you don't have to have programming skills if you don't want to. Um, uh, it might be a really great thing to, if you're really passionate about this, start writing, start uh, writing blogs after you read about a bunch of user experience stuff start writing about games that did stuff really well games that did stuff uh, poorly um, try and focus on one specific user um, uh, I want to do this these are the steps I have to go through to do them uh, and I mean that's that's a that's essentially a shippable product for somebody who is focused on UX thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, I do actually just have a silly math question. Ooh. So, if your teacher has ten beer bottles in one hand and five beer bottles in the other, what does she have? Uh, a drinking problem. <laughs> you probably heard it before, but it's kind of funny. I was oh. just like, why not? Yeah. Or a deadline. Yeah. <laughs> or, or a hangover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a new job to find. Hi. Um, so I'm about to graduate from the University of Oregon, and I have a question. I'm an artist, and when you look at portfolios and resumes, which are the ones like um, stood out to you, and like kind of why, and like you know, to break through the noise of all the other artists that want to also be aspiring. Well, so honestly, from my position, more often than not, it's what's going on in the industry, like kind of what, because I'm staffing teams for a variety of different projects, uh, kind of. Uh, I'm working with a lot of different clients that are coming from a lot of different, like, well, here's actually, I mean, like, Clash Royale. Like, when that game came out and hit it out of the park, suddenly all of these other companies were trying to mimic that style. Yep. And so suddenly I'm trying to hire guys that I know, or girls, you know, people that can uh, hit that style. And so that's just something that flies on my radar, you know. And then, you know, like, when Blizzard kind of establishes this general look for all of their art, like Hearthstone cards and stuff like that, that's something that other companies are starting to rip off and trying to hit, and so that's something, that, you know, so it's really, it varies depending on kind of what's going on in the industry, um, and I, 
so yeah, that so kind of speaks to maybe being a little bit more general and being able to kind of hit a lot of different things. Um, so yeah, I can't really say anything really particularly stands out as far as just portfolio work, other than showing a good level of polish. I think it's always, like you always want to have like one fully complete solid piece at least. Like ideally you want to have a lot more, but uh, just to really see like, okay, this is how far that guy can push it. Or that girl, sorry, I'm gonna use guy as just a general, apologize, I had a time for that. But uh, this is just how well this person can push their work and I can expect that kind of level. Um, just to kind of harp on that as well, so to sort of build on it. Um, something that I've experienced in the past with a lot of my friends who are artists as well, is making sure your art style fits the theme of whatever's being worked on. Uh, maybe you're really awesome at drawing mechs. Like maybe you just make the most awesome Gundam looking things in the world. Or maybe that's not your forte, you kind of have a more cartoony style. Um, applying to places that kind of embrace your art style will definitely help you a lot. And you can focus on that instead of trying to you know, maybe you don't want to necessarily draw a cartoony, blocky game. That's not your forte. So just kind of study up on what they're working on and their upcoming projects, and that helps a lot. Like, you can get placed because someone sees one of your drawings at the right time for a character they're working on. That happened with Paragon. Um, we hired a couple concept artists there just because we're like, that skin would be awesome on that character. We should date that guy right now. So, you know, yeah. do your homework as well on the, per the people that you're working for. Yeah, for I, I sure. Would, I would say, if possible, have you done any work um, within a game engine at all? Like, have you put uh, your art into? Okay, excellent. So I was going to say, if you hadn't, you should really do that. Um, you know, there, there's there's a whole lot of people who can open Max and like grab ZBrush and make something that looks absolutely gorgeous. And if you give them a polygon budget, they don't know what, what to do. So, okay. Thank you very much for your Thank question. You. Yeah, great question. Hello, uh, my name is Alex. I'm also graduating from the. Oregon, but with a computer science degree. Uh, and so I was wondering, uh, I, I build up uh, kind of a resume. I've like won some things at hackathons. I have like projects that I'm working on. Uh, and uh, and uh, I even got like an interview book with different questions that they might ask in interviews. But I feel like there's still something missing before I actually like start going to interviews. Was there any missing piece that you guys had to kind of learn in like the beginning of interview processes or things like that that really helped you? The, the things that became... became <laughs> I, you, go, you go first, you got this. Um, I, I've always winged it. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I would say... Uh, I, I guess... Um, probably the missing piece is that you don't think you're ready yet. It's the biggest missing yeah. piece. Like... Um, you know, there, there is, there, there's no, like, even just, you know, what several people talked about, there's nothing wrong with uh, not getting a job from an interview. It doesn't mean that you're, um, you know, you can't hack it. Um, it just means that you're not the right fit for the team then, or you are still on the interview list after they found the person that they really wanted. I mean, there, there's any number of reasons that, uh, for why you don't get a particular job. Um, and, um, spoiler alert, you can uh, apply for another job at that company later. Um, <laughs> it, that's, that's not a bad thing. Uh, it's not like, uh, you know, unless you were an asshole. You know, you, sh you did show up to the interview on time and you weren't an asshole, right? So then in that case, then w when you interview the next time, you can be like, hey, you know, this is what I've done since then. Um, and maybe you're a better fit for that opening or that point in time or maybe that particular producer decides they think you'd be the right uh, person to fit the team that they want to build. So some, um, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Go so ahead. something uh, that we had gone on earlier in this conversation was speaking to the concept of building something to a level of completion. That doesn't mean anything huge. It doesn't mean anything special. It just means kind of a completed piece. It has all the edges, all the pieces, the gears are in the right locations. I mean, you've gone to hackathons, so you've put things together. Maybe they're not complete, but they're a start. They look like something. If you don't have anything like that in your resume, those can help. Those help me specifically is the reason I'm bringing this up. I had projects that had gone through all the levels and maybe didn't ship, but they were put together. They had all the assets, the frameworks, the gameplay, the art, the story. They were all there, held together in some way. Now, you don't have to have a game. You don't have to have all those things. We have to show something that shows that you're, you're seeing the start and the end of a project, not just the start. Also, one thing worth noting, um, I've probably had more failed interviews than everyone in this area. Like, when I first tried, I think I interviewed at, like, 36 different studios. 
Um, I did not know what I was talking about. And it took a long time to get that footing of like, what did they want to hear? What are they looking for? Um, if you fail one or two of them, do not feel bad about it. It is going to happen. And that's not and always going to even be a reflection on you. I've lost, I've had positions I was accepted for where the budget actually reversed afterwards and had to have a very awkward phone call about, hey, that job we just gave you no longer exists. Um, so there's tons of things to think about. Team need. Um, when we, I was working with Sony, actually, we ran out of building space. We had to let people go because there wasn't actually enough desk space to sit anybody down anymore. So, you know, people who were doing fine work and had nothing wrong with their, their performance actually were let go because we needed to move in like a senior AI programmer instead of a junior FX designer. So um, be persistent. Uh, one thing that is also really important, be willing to move. Um, I've moved all the way from the East Coast to Oregon mm -hmm. and back to the East Coast. Um, my brother went from North Carolina to Boston to California and now Seattle working with Riot Games. Uh, you know, you can be very flexible within your own limits, you know. Um, a lot of places don't want to relocate you. That could be a simple reason. So don't take it all personally, just keep at it. Um, if you have a resume after the show, feel free to show me and I can kind of give you some tips as well. Yeah, and one thing I want to just add is there's a tendency, especially when you're just starting out, like even if you are hired at a place where everything seems like it's the biggest deal in the world. It's like this interview, if I don't get it, oh my God, you know, and, it's, and you're going to have another interview. Like you're going to live for hopefully another, you know, 50 plus years. Like you're going to have a lot of interviews. You're going to be working on a lot of projects and a lot of deadlines. And uh, that's like... I think only something's gonna come with experience, but just knowing that eventually you're gonna be like, wait, I have done projects before, I have had interviews before, this is gonna, yeah. Thank you for I, your I'd question. I'd also say just, oh, my bad, I'm cutting you off over here. Uh, I was gonna say just, uh, as everybody thinks about interviews, whether it's your first time interviewing or you've done it before, um, it's probably gonna be a lot harder as far as the first time goes, because it's your first time, but, um, if you're interviewing for a position on a game team, chances are the producer, uh, or at least your immediate producer, is going to be in that interview. Uh, and just because you're an artist or you're a programmer um, does not mean you should ignore the producer in that interview because the producer is probably going to be asshole number one in your life and they are going to make your life... They have the biggest potential to make your life miserable, probably more so than your programmer lead or your art lead. Um, so even though it's going to be difficult to not be like, oh my god, I just want a programming job in the game industry, oh my god, take a look at the, take a look at the, the producer. Um, they're the ones with the timeline. Um, and like I said, don't be an asshole. The producer's job is to be an asshole. <laughs> and, and at least if it's if it's if it's not, I don't know about you guys. If it, if, if their job is not that, then I don't know why they all are. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you're joining a team. Um, that that's the biggest thing to remember. You're joining a team. You're going to be working with these guys. And we, even though we didn't talk touch on it during crunch, when lots of people are working the eighty plus hours a week, everybody gets a little short-tempered so you were you were working with a team you can't you cannot ship your product without the team the team is really everything so make sure that these are people that you really want to work with it's gonna be hard on your first job but at the very least think about it even if you say like oh, I'm not really sure but I really want to take the job because then you can learn from it you know for the future thank you thank you Thanks. As someone that's just starting a portfolio, do you think that it's more important to try to get, tackle like a small game and be able to say that you did every part of it and you know the big picture, or to try to just go straight into a specific role with a group of friends or some kind of smaller team? Uh, I actually think it's the company that you're applying for that matters most on whether or not that portfolio will work. There's a lot of companies that really need singular roles, singular specific oriented people you know we need a designer that just does ui ux we need a mechanics designer a systems designer they need these pieces we need an fx artist we need a 3d model we need a um an animator they're looking for those hyper detail oriented people someone who can produce a skill at a very high level and very specific you know goals set for that person but there are other studios indie studios love the T-shaped person. They love the ability to have an artist who's also an engineer, 
a designer who is also a writer and a producer and a person doing marketing. You know, the more multifaceted you are for indie, the better you are because it means you're able to hit roles that no one else can hit for your team. You're able to support them in ways that no one else could because you don't have the budget, you don't have the manpower, but you have the knowledge. But but being a specific person can land you that triple A role, and that's, that's important as well. I don't want to dismiss the idea of becoming the excellent animator, the excellent designer. Yeah, I would say it's really kind of up to, to you. I mean, it's where your passion is. There's no wrong way to do it with that. It's, but if you are intrigued by all the elements of something, of a project, then why not pursue that? And if you are really only interested in one aspect, then why not pursue that? It, in my opinion, anyways, and I definitely... Yeah, I agree with that. Um, like, yeah, I, I, I think you're going to hurt yourself by uh, uh, stressing too much about how I get into the game industry. Like, just, you know, kind of that just build things, which I realize is general advice. If you really want to f focus on just one thing because you love to do that, then absolutely do that. If you want to build all of the things, Go ahead and do that. Uh, if you do choose to build all of the things, I would try and pick one thing that maybe you like the most that you really put a lot of polish on so that you can say, hey, you know, I did kind of all this, you know, start to finish, but this is the one thing that I really wanted to um, polish up the most. And if also if you choose to go uh, down that and, you know, you know, you're doing programming and you're doing art and you're doing, you know, kind of all that sort of thing, um, don't sell that experience short because it's not just that you can do all of those things, it's that you have learned a little bit about each of the pieces of the world that exists in a game development team, which is incredibly valuable because that means that you can be a communication bridge between, say, the programming team and the art lead because the art lead says we really need this to... Uh, you know, to execute the vision we want for this, and you can come back to the programming team and say, like, okay, guys, he said this, what we actually need to build is this. This is what they're trying to do. Um, and, like, you know, just said communication is everything. So if you want to be a journalist and you want to do multiple things, then try and learn the language of each of those kind of sub-disciplines so that you can talk, mul you know, you can talk to multiple teams, and that's very valuable. I think uh, harping on that as well, Asking the studio is generally not frowned upon. Um, if you're looking for like a particular game or studio, you can generally ask them a question of like, hey, uh, I saw you had an opening for this position. What are you looking for? Um, if you need somebody, for example, a studio that wants very specific facial animations, and that's your forte, then you should highlight that. You should absolutely show off, like, I can do great facial work on all these things. Uh, maybe they want a skeleton mesh kind of guy. You know, these are all different aspects of the art side that you can choose to be broad, kind of like going tall or wide, right? You can be the guy for all facial animations. You can also be the guy who does like the entire concept of the character. Um, harping on what they were saying, make sure you know what you want to do. I personally think that going in the beginning, I think it's better to go wide and be broad and everything, but have a specialization that you can reference. So um, with your portfolio, show off that you have a basic understanding of doing X, Y, and Z. But have that X be like your strong point. Maybe some extra detail on that to show like, you know, I've got that specialization. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. No problem. Hello there. Uh, I'm currently a sophomore computer science student at OSU. And uh, I've been, uh, after talking to like designers and, and coders and developers here, I found that I'm also really interested in that design aspect. Like the creative aspect, not so much the art, but uh, I do have a little bit of background in that. But I was just wondering how valuable that degree is in moving up towards a design part. Or um, okay, yeah. well, so. I, I, knowing from experience, uh, there's very few, there's very few designers that I know that do not know at least a little bit of coding. Um, that being said, uh, I never found my computer science education to be really worth anything. Um, I didn't finish it, uh, but uh, I had been programming for 10 years by the time I got to college, so there's, there's that too. Um, it is very, very difficult to get a job as a designer uh, because while everyone else, can, uh, kind of the other disciplines can go through and say, well, uh, you know, I know how to test and done bugs, like I can hear, I can produce these 
uh, you know, this, the, the, you know, this, this indie game that I helped test, and these are the bugs that I found, that sort of thing. Or I can show you this code, I can show you these models, these drawings. Uh, nobody really wants to look at spreadsheets. Um, and that is probably a lot of what you're going to end up working with. Uh, so it's very, very difficult to, to start off with, hey, I'm a designer. Um, if you do really want to go down that path, this may seem like, this may not be the 100% best advice, but for do a thing and ship it, uh, being a dungeon master is probably one of the things that you can do to show that you can build worlds uh, and that you can that you have made something engaging within the confines of an existing system. So to speak on the design side of that, because uh, that's all I get to do, is um, you do need some computer science background. As he said, almost all designers know some level of code, some level of scripting. They can put content together. They can make it play themselves. Might be within the, the, the engineers, the coders engine, but there are tool assets that are usually built for designers. There's something that allows them a little bit of access, some tools to put something together in a little easier way, but you still need to understand logic. So that teaching is not going to harm you in any way inside your design site. You need to be able to produce without an engineer helping. You can't just write the scene and assume they'll put it together. That doesn't work. So that's just, no one's ever going to do that for you, ever. Um, but at the same point, they're, they're drastically different. Uh, design side deals with a ton of uh, the conceptual gameplay pieces, your mechanics, your story, your narrative, your tone, all these weird, fancy words that no one really understands until they get a big critique about it, and they go, oh, I should really Google that. Um, so if you're really interested in those pieces, there's a lot of good books about how design works and kind of understanding the modalities and, and the ways it works. So like uh, one that really helped me on my way was a, a book called A Book of Lenses. Um, and it's a solid book about design through all facets. It actually goes through a guy who worked as a Disney Imagineer and working at building rides there and, and how it worked for families and groups and gender differences between activities. And it really helps you understand what you're doing as a designer is to think about your players and their interaction. They're going to have your controllers, your world, your stories, your words. And that if that seems like the interesting part to you at this point, then I, I would have no problem saying go for it. It is the career path, though, that is the most populated. It has the highest density of people going into it. It has the highest density of people coming out of it. Engineers are harder to find. Artists are harder to find designers or not and the reason is is because it's a lot easier to call yourself a designer when no one says can you design and have a markable check sheet for it yeah, basically everybody who plays video games think they thinks they could design they're, 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 it's just it's the classic it, rule it, actually it really, like, if, if you become a designer you will have a friend coming up like oh design's really cool I have a great idea for a video game and you're going to be so angry yeah like yeah. so angry so that's it's fine, and, and I mean it's a worthwhile pursuit, and it's a good place to be. But understand that your computer science degree is not going to harm you in getting a design job either. It'll help. You can you can find plenty of work in your degree, probably to build your own game with your design behind it, and show that you are capable of both parts. Just make sure you know that one you want more than the other, and and try and fight for it if you really want to fight for it. Yeah, I think it's a good case where just doing it too, like finding other like-minded people, whether you find a programmer that maybe just doesn't want to design a system, but likes programming, or you find an artist that, you know, just needs someone who can program and needs a designer, and you just pick up the slack, whether that be doing the art or whether that be the programming, and you just got to be charismatic as hell to get people to want to work around your design, and, but then you can at least have something that you can go to someone and be like, hey, I designed this and I worked with this team to do it, and that's going to be more impressive than trying to get them to read a bunch of spreadsheets or just saying designer on a resume. Yeah, designers really need to be able to, ultimately, you're, you need to sell a story more than um, pretty much any other discipline in the game industry, not just internally, but to the players. You've got to inspire somebody to put down the cash to make the game. You have to inspire the programmer to keep working on this system to make it as tunable as you need it even when they're really sick of it like it's, 
it's you need, you need to be a really great communicator. Oh, well, and actually, uh, something really quick about that is you also don't need to limit yourself to just video games. I mean, this is everything from just you know like board games, card games. Just, oh yeah. If you're doing these just quick, you know, like mock-ups of things, that's still demonstrable skills that you can go and show. And I mean, there's so many apps that are based off of and can be played just with you know dice and little pieces of paper. I, I you know. It, yeah, uh, basically a way to imp- like somebody. If you walk up to a designer and say, "I have an idea for a game," they really want to hit you. Um, but if you say, "Hey, I uh, made this small card game and balanced it," and it doesn't matter if it's like you just take note cards and do it, they will love the shit out of that. Let me tell you, all designers are the same. They all love their board games and their like tabletop games, like uh, like I, Warhammer uh, or War Machine. They really like War Machine over Warhammer for some. But anyway, because we're monsters, love it. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Legion of Everblade. Um, but yeah, if you like talking about non-video game game design to game designers, like yeah, that's that's the good stuff. So like, absolutely. Uh, at PAX last year, we I spent six to eight hours test test playing other people's board games because I thought it was a fun thing to do. I was giving critiques, seeing the cool ideas and interest values and, and how they're trying to get people to play the games. I thought it was super fun. But if you come up and you say, I have this flimsy excuse for an idea of a video game, I will cry <laughs> immediately. Like, what? Just, mm. it's better have a beer what? in your hand for it's pretty funny, though. One thing I also think is worth noting, um, identifying what kind of design you want to do will carry you way farther than just saying, I want to be a designer. There's a lot of different types. Do you want to be a level designer? Do you want to design UI? Do you want to design storylines? Um, you know, scripted events? Open bad. Like, Multiplayer. There are tons. And um, shameless plug of the day, I have a friend who we used to work with. One of the ways he's starting to teach himself design is he runs a YouTube series called The Game a Week, where he makes a game from start to finish, and he puts up the entire process on YouTube. It's like an hour long, and he's made eight of them. And each one's getting a little bit more complex, and he kind of breaks down the challenges associated with it. Like uh, his first game, for example, very questionable, very basic, a lot of bugs. But as you see the progression in his own education, it's something that's a really good talking point. It's going to a recruiter and going, here's a portfolio of things that I've made, and being like, I have a series that other people are actually learning how to do this from me. You um, don't need to do this, by the way. That's a lot of work. Yeah. You know, he's, game a week is... This guy's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking building it from the bottom up with assets. And, uh, you know, there are programs that can help you. Like Unreal has a marketplace, for example, if you use Unreal Engine. Uh, Unity 2D, they have free-to-play stuff that you can use and, like, borrow assets and share them. So taking those things and, and taking what you know and applying it, even if it's a basic little platforming game, that's a game. It doesn't have to be this, you know, you don't need to make, um, you know, like Soul Calibur or something to be like, I know how to make games. Um, that would be nice. I mean, that would get you a job anywhere in the industry if you're like, I single-handedly made this game. But you could also just make, be like, I made a couple awesome characters. Um, working on Paragon, for example, guys who started in QA that are now designers were champion designers. They pitched character ideas that were adopted by the design team, and they fleshed them out. So really kind of take your time to analyze like what kind of designer you want to be, and that will really perpetuate you into like being able to better prepare at those things. Yeah, and actually, I want to touch on that. Uh, what he's talking about with like the YouTube channel kind of thing, like uh, the internet is an amazing tool for just like not only engaging with communities but building communities. With whether, whether you're doing you know game design or whether you're doing art or whatever you're doing, you can be posting places, and it's going to be uh, a driving force for you because you're going to start getting engagement, and you're going to have this like cool history of like your first you know game that you started playtesting or your first drawing sketch and then you know after like three years of doing this you're going to be like holy crap i am so much better than i was and then you're also going to have this documentation that you can go and take to people and say like yeah this is what i do and a lot of times like when i'm looking for an artist uh, and i'm like going through their portfolio like i'll check like their tumblr i'll check their art station thing and just kind of see what is the stuff that they're working on and i might see some little scribble that they did for some character that's just random to them but it might fit perfectly you know what i'm kind of looking for right now to fill a, a position on a team so, uh, so let's, we should make sure we can get through oh, all yeah. the questions well, as well. We're, we're not going to get the time, but I'm going to put this out there really quickly. Uh, a lot of us, at least two of us, will be uh, outside of the convention area answering other questions that may not be answered from this event afterwards. So if you still have questions you would like answered or have a small conversation with us, please follow with. But we only have 
about five minutes left. Thank you so much for your question, by the way. Thank you guys so I'm much. I'm very sorry we didn't get to you, you guys' questions. <laughs> but, oh, no, no. Oh, we, no, we still we, do? Oh, yeah. good. Oh, great. great, great. We, we okay. still have... For oh, anyone who, who won't get their chance on the mic to ask their question, I would really like to see if you still have your question. I'll be outside the hall for me or for any stuff that might be with us. I will us. be outside the hall as but, well. But yeah, uh, please, we, we, we have hall. time for one last question. Uh, all right, I will try and make this kind of quick. Okay. Oh. Okay. Should I just tongue her? Yes. yes. Uh, anyways, uh, I am a junior at the Art Institute, and I have a particular interest in level building uh, and cursed level design. And uh, a lot of the games I've been working with lately have a lot of this railroading aspect that I've seen a lot in these AAA games where you kind of go in one side and then you exit the other. Um, good examples of going against that grain would probably be, say, Dark Souls, where another bad example would say be Necropolis. Um, I'm wondering how... How important is using vertical mapping in uh, setting up a level design, and uh, how important is making an area accessible from multiple directions versus a singular? So that fits a lot into understanding how your world needs to be told and experienced. So when you look at a world that needs to be accessible due to the way the play feels, the, the way the combat or the movement works, you're looking at a world that maybe needs directionality from all areas. If you see a place, should you be able to go to it? It's kind of maybe what your mechanics will define. So in a game like Dark Souls, you're looking at a game with very strict control sets that allow you to interact in a very precise way. You always feel like you are under full control of your character. It's never taken away from you by animations. Uh, the only times you really lose it is if you get grabbed by a big monster and they squish you to death. Uh, so that's a great game that shows how to enter and exit a space correctly, how you can find locations, and if you can see something that looks like the mechanics lead to it, you are allowed to go to that space. Uh, in other games, I think it's very important to block off those spaces, on the other hand, if they're used as uh, narrative storytelling pieces. If you do not need to use that space for gameplay, because it wouldn't fit your gameplay. If walking into that location or that area would just be a bland moment of flat existence, but with beautiful art all around you, it might not fit the way your character moves. It might not fit your combat experience or how your character should be allowed into the world. So a lot of those times when you think about building height or a three-dimensional or a 3D design for like an open world game and you're creating this one very interesting point of location, how to enter it from, you want to think, is this good for my character? Is this good for our play? Before you think about, is this a space I need to even work on? Because if it's not matching those two pieces, you're going to have a really bad experience walking in and finding out that that moment, even though it's really beautiful, you spent time on it, doesn't fit your play anymore. Oh man, we use a, uh, a you know, sword-wheeling 2D lock-on system like Zelda games, but this situation has so many pieces of ground and trees and logs on the ground that's completely unmaneuverable for the player, even though it's a breathtaking moment. Well, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Maybe, maybe it would have been better to make a opening in the field with a lot of trees around the sides of it. All of a sudden, you have a really great vista scene walk-in and a great fight sequence area. So understanding what play will happen in a location really helps build what you need for it. And understanding if your mechanics match that allows you to know whether or not to allow it to be even a playable experience. And well, at, a, at a higher level, I'd just say kind of one of the most important things about being a level designer is uh, doing what the game design lead tells you to do. <laughs> uh, if they want it to be open world and they say like, yeah, go nuts, make some things that are just fun for you that are going to delight the player when they find them. Okay, cool, you get to do that. Otherwise, uh, you know, with every complexity that you add, you add more QA time and you piss off your design lead. One, one thing worth mentioning too with this, um, it's very easy to get lost in uh, the middle of the fight here. In every studio I worked at, I don't know if you guys can verify, art and design fight a lot. It's always been that design is very gameplay focused and they want it to be clean and run in 60 and not disrupt things. Art wants to showcase how beautiful the engine can look at its finest levels of fidelity. This doesn't always work out well. Um, I've seen full-on screaming matches between art directors and lead designers who both wanted the greatest for the scene, but um, there's other factors to consider as well. 3D mapping, for example, can be expensive. Um, if you're on a console, for example, you have to think of your hardware limitations with your design. 
yes, you could probably make an amazing thing. Um, something that happened with Paragon. We built our game from the ground up to be on PC specifically. And so we weren't, and then we were a PS4 game too. We had to <laughs> literally redo our entire map. We had to break the entire game back down to a fundamental level because while our game ran on PC at 60 frames, on PS4 we were at seven. Zero, seven frames. So it was a real challenge to determine who was right. I mean, art showed what we could do if we absolutely wanted graphics to be everything. Uh, just but then gameplay died. So um, it's definitely really mindful to, like, I think something that's often under underutilized with art is remembering that you have a finite number of resources that you can use. Your character is going to use some, your effects are going to use some, your level are going to use some, the atmosphere is going to use some. And balancing, that is a tricky process. So, um, so not, not to cut you off here, Derek, I'm going to give it to Marshall just for this last moment, and we got to wrap it up right after you. Sure. Okay. Oh, what? Oh, okay. Uh, you ever go to, like, the airport, and, you know, like, your goal is to get from point A and then, like, to the gate and get, you know, pat it down. And if you're the only one there and that little course is going like this, then that's defeating the purpose. I mean, the focus is to get from point A to point B, and so that's kind of... Uh, what, just what's your goal for your game, you know? Like what is, and if, if your goal is to get the player from point A to point B and the point is to tell this aspect of the story, then maybe you don't need all this extra stuff. But if your point is to the vast expansion or the be able to play with all these pieces, then of course you're gonna want more room for them to, I don't know, ride a Zelda horse around. You know, like, yeah. So thank you for your question. Uh, I would like to thank everyone who is sitting here and watch this presentation or our, our small silly panel. Uh, once again, I would like to thank my uh, co-panelists uh, and uh, have a great con and thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. If you guys have any additional questions, uh, we're going to be outside. We can field the ones we didn't get time to handle on the stage. So, see you there. <laughs>